Simon flies his kite and dreams of the day he'll fly a plane. Seventy years ago, another dreamer stood and flew his kites, dreaming of the day when man would fly. But Lawrence Hargrave was a practical Australian who studied birds and insects closely to learn how they flew. From observing the shape of birds' wings, he found that a curved surface gave an increased lift, and with this knowledge, he built and flew box kites that could carry weights. These kites were Hargrave's great contribution to the beginning of powered flight. Some of the earliest successful flying machines were based on the Hargrave box kite. One was the Santos Dumont biplane, the first to fly in Europe in 1906. The early Australian aviators were not far behind those in Europe and America, and in 1911, a Sydney dentist, W. E. Hart, made the first overland flight from Penrith to Parramatta in a Bristol aircraft. During the early stages of World War I, a great deal of research was carried out on aircraft, and both sides realised its military value. The flimsy pre-war flying machine quickly became a fast and efficient weapon. After the war, the aircraft that had carried bombs were used to carry passengers and cargo. In 1919, Ross and Keith Smith in their wartime Vickers bomber pioneered the England to Australia air route and won the 10,000 pound prize offered by the Australian government. Australians had long needed a means of travel faster than road transport for crossing rough country and covering the great distances of the inland. Aviation could now provide this, and in 1921, Western Australian Airlines began the first regular airmail service between Geraldton and Derby. Also in 1921, at Longreach, Queensland, World War I pilots Hudson Fish and PJ McGuinness founded their Queensland and Northern Territory Aerial Service, better known as Qantas. From a shaky start with two aircraft, Qantas grew into one of the world's major airlines. In 1928, Charles Kingsford Smith flew the Pacific in the famous monoplane Southern Cross, linking Australia with the United States. 1934, saw the first regular airmail service begin between Australia and Britain following the route first flown by the Smith brothers 15 years before. Aviation was at last bringing Australia closer to the world. Isolated from the rest of the world by the oceans, modern Australia is still itself a land of distance. 
If we compare Great Britain with Australia on the same scale, we see that it is a small country with the main cities and towns close to one another. Our state capitals are hundreds of miles apart and many country towns and pastoral properties are isolated from the cities. One half of the population lives in these towns and settlements dotted across the inland. The other half of the Australian people lives in the cities along the eastern and southern coasts. Roads and railways connect the cities and towns, but transport by these is often too slow to meet the needs of the people. These are the reasons why Australia has become one of the most air-minded countries in the world. Most Australians who travel by air fly on our highly developed internal services. There are two interstate airlines and nine other major services operating within Australia and Papua New Guinea. In 1965, almost four million people travelled by air in Australia. Most state capitals have several daily flights and businessmen or tourists can reach almost any part of Australia in the one day. The airlines, however, are not only interested in passengers. All flights carry air mail and air cargo and urgent items of cargo like blood plasma or newsreel film are shipped quickly to all points of the country. For bulky cargoes, the airlines have special freighter aircraft and use fast handling methods for a quicker turnaround. Australia has its own overseas airline, Qantas. Qantas flies to all continents except South America and is a big earner of overseas money for Australia. It is especially important for business firms wanting to export their products quickly to overseas markets. In 1965, Qantas carried more than 400,000 passengers to and from our shores. The big city airports are becoming crowded as more planes are needed to carry the growing number of people who travel by air. To the people of the cities, the aeroplane is only a faster means of transport for themselves or the cargoes, and for the children, just a fascination. But to the children of Milton Park Cattle Station in Central Australia, the aeroplane means far more than it does to the city people. It is their weekly contact with the outside world, for the Willock family lives 100 miles from their nearest town, Alice Springs. The plane brings a friend to stay with the Willocks, 
and also has on board their weekly supply of bread, groceries, and the mailbag. Soon the brief visit is over and the pilot is off to the next station on his long mail run, a run that would take several days by car. Dr. Emerson flies on his rounds to the cattle stations and settlements in Central Australia, flying sometimes up to 500 miles a day to see a handful of patients. Today he goes first to a cattle station where eight-year-old Jane is in bed with a nasty cold. Jane's mother radioed the symptoms 200 miles to the hospital in Alice Springs and Dr. Emerson said he'd call the next day. After Dr. Emerson has examined Jane, he flies on 100 miles to Ernabella Mission, where he calls regularly. In the Alice Springs area, the Department of Health cooperates with the Royal Flying Doctor Service to provide medical and dental care for the people living in this isolated region. The Department of Health provides the doctor and aircraft, while the Royal Flying Doctor Service controls the radio network. These people who live so far from doctors and hospitals can have medical care within hours. Perhaps this is the greatest service the aeroplane has given to our country. In other sparsely populated areas, the aeroplane is being used as a tool for development. In New Guinea, flying passengers and freight into inaccessible towns and villages. Also, in the needs of national development, specially equipped aircraft are used for aerial mapping and surveying for minerals. All kinds of Australians are using light planes now, either for business or pleasure. Graziers and businessmen use light planes to visit their far-flung interests. Farmers use them for spreading fertilizers and spraying crops, while charter companies fly clients swiftly over the country in light planes. With the development of more reliable light aircraft and improved navigation aids, more people are learning to fly. Paul is 18 and wants to be a commercial pilot. He will do all his basic training in a light plane to gain his commercial license before he joins an airline. Skilled pilots are needed in Australia, and once Paul has the necessary experience, he will enter the world of aviation as a qualified pilot, flying the various planes that serve Australia. 
in light planes as a charter pilot, flying instructor or crop duster. Or flying the mails and stores to the people of the outback. Or the doctor. Flying passengers and freight across Australia on the nation's internal airlines or flying the world on the overseas services. Simon flies his kite. When Simon's father was a boy, aeroplanes were in their infancy. When Simon becomes a man, who can tell in what new ways aeroplanes will work for Australia?